Good evening, and welcome to Dimensions of Prophecy. Tonight's presentation, Our Day in the Light of Bible Prophecy, will be a fantastic journey through history. Together, we'll see how God, with the stroke of the pen, traced the entire history of the human race. His predictions were made literally thousands of years before the events took place in history, and without fail, his predictions continue to come true. During tonight's presentation, Pastor Kenneth Cox will study with us the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 2. As events recorded in this chapter unfold before us, we'll see how God traced history all the way down to our present day. We'll see from Scripture where we're living, what's happening today, and just how this relates to the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know you'll be thrilled with tonight's presentation. A real blessing awaits you. Now, let's enjoy the music, then tonight's timely topic, Our Day in the Light of Bible Prophecy. I'm very happy to welcome each of you to the Dimensions of Prophecy. Dimensions of Prophecy is basically a program designed for two things. One, it's to introduce men and women to Jesus Christ. Two, we find there are a lot of people that have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and given their heart to them. But when it comes to picking up the Scripture and reading it and understanding what the Scripture's talking about, a lot of people are at sea. They just read it, but they don't understand what it's saying. And we hope over the next few nights as we study God's Word that it'll begin to open up. And you'll begin to understand things that you haven't understood before. We hope it'll be a blessing to you. That's the purpose of the dimensions of prophecy. Maybe you have had an opportunity sometime to visit the capital of our country. And if you have ever visited the capital of our country, you've gone there and you have seen such places as the Lincoln Memorial, or maybe the Jefferson Memorial, or the Washington Monument, or of course the Capitol. If you've ever had the opportunity to walk down through the halls of the legislature and visit the Senate. But you know, there's a building in Washington, D.C. that's a very, very beautiful building, but not too many people go there and visit it. And it's called the Library of Congress. And if you were to go to the Library of Congress, and as you walk through the front doors, you walk into a large rotunda, a great big round ceiling that is supported by beams. And on those beams, they have statements that have been written by senators or presidents or writers or poets and so forth. One of those beams has a statement that was written on it by Tennyson. And this is what it says. One God, one law, one element, and one far-off divine event to which the whole creation moves. A lot of people tonight, a lot of people that are living in this day, in this age, seem to think that we are moving towards some divine event that's about to take place. They don't understand, many of them, what that event is, but the events around them are convincing them that we're moving towards some event that's about to take place. A lot of people are thinking. They're wondering what are these things. They see the moves that are being taken by Russia, and they wonder if this isn't moving us towards that event that's about to take place. Others are concerned about China with her teeming millions of people, and they think that the moves that China is making is indications of where we are in Bible prophecy. There are other people that are very concerned tonight about the economy. Now, let me tell you something. We're not just having problems with the economy in the United States. The problem of economy is no longer just a problem in country after country. It's a problem. wonder if this isn't a direct indication of where we are, what's happening. Others are concerned about our resources, food, oil, all the natural resources that we have that are being depleted. They feel that this is an indication of the problems that we're moving towards some event that's about to take place. Others tonight 
are very, very concerned about food, that there just isn't enough. Too many people tonight that are dying of starvation. Two-thirds of the world going to bed hungry. People feel that this is a sign, an indication that we're moving towards that divine event that's about to take place. And because of this, many thinking men and women are picking up the Bible. They're picking it up and they're beginning to read it, trying to find some indication of where we are. And many of them are turning to the books of Daniel and Revelation, hoping that there they might find some indication of where we are in Bible prophecy and what's about to happen. Over the last few years, we have seen a religious movement take place. I don't know if you can remember, oh, 15, 20 years ago, you hardly ever heard a politician say anything about God. 20 years ago, politicians just didn't say much about God at all. And then long came Jimmy Carter, and he told everybody that he was a born-again Christian. And you begin to hear senators and legislators begin to refer to God a little more. And then long came Ronald Reagan, and uh, he began to make statements about the Bible and God. And so today you find that many senators, legislators are saying things about God. Something good about that, but sometimes we find that they do that just because they think it's politically helpful to them. Like the other day I heard a couple senators were talking and this one senator had been to a convention and uh, he said while he was there at the convention they had asked him to offer the Lord's Prayer. And his friend, the other senator, said, well, did you offer the Lord's Prayer? And he said, yes. And he said, well, his friend said to him, said, I didn't know you knew the Lord's Prayer. And he said, sure, I know the Lord's Prayer. And his senator friend said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you $10 if you can say the Lord's Prayer. And the senator said, okay. And he said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And his senator friend pulled out $10 and gave it to him and said, I didn't know you knew it. <laughs> See, and that pretty much is the situation that we find with a lot of people with, by, with the Bible. They don't understand what it's saying. It's all up front. And many people are concerned. They're getting into the books of Daniel and Revelation and trying to find out what God's Word has to say about the time in which you and I are living. In the book of Daniel, it has this to say. You see, Daniel is a book of prophecy, and it tells us this, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The book of Daniel is a book of prophecy, and many people felt that that book of prophecy was a closed book that it couldn't be understood. But you find that the books of Daniel and Revelation go together like a hand in a glove. All the prophecies that are in the book of Daniel are repeated in the book of Revelation. Revelation means just exactly what it says. It is a revealing. It reveals the prophecies of God. So when you get to the book of Revelation here in the 10th chapter in verse 2, the little book now that in Daniel is sealed, here in Revelation it says it's open. And he had a little book open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So we find that the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation have opened up and many people are picking those books up and reading them, trying to understand where we are in the light of Bible prophecy. Tonight, we're going to drop way back as God picks up the nation of Babylon, and we're going to watch as God just reveals the history of mankind right on down to our present day. And I want you to go back with me to the book of Daniel, and we're going to take a look at the second chapter in verse 28, and it says, But there is a God in heaven who revealeth secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be when. In the latter days, that's the days in which you and I are living in. He said, I'm going to reveal to you, Nebuchadnezzar, what will be in the latter days. Okay, your dream, 
and your vision of your head upon your bed were these. So Daniel is going to show Nebuchadnezzar what God showed him in that dream. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. But when he woke up in the morning, he couldn't remember what he had dreamed. He knew that it was extremely important. But for the life of him, he couldn't recall it. And it says that he called in all the wise men of his realm. He told him, I had a dream, but I can't remember what it is. And he said, it's gone from me, but I know it's important. Tell me what I dreamed. And they said, King, tell you what? You tell us what you dreamed, and we'll tell you what the meaning is. And he said, well, you tell me what I dreamed, and then I'll know for sure you can tell me what the meaning is. And they said, well, the gods up in heaven wouldn't make such a request. And the more those wise men talked, the matter, the king became. In fact, he became so furious that he commanded all the wise men of Babylon to be slain. And it says, for this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave a command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Among those wise men of Babylon were four young men, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. These four young men were considered wise men, but they were novice. They were young. And so when Nebuchadnezzar called in his wise men to interpret the dream, he didn't call in these young men. But when he became angry, he didn't make any difference. He said, destroy them all. And so the captain of the guard goes to get Daniel and his companions to slay them. And this is what it says. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. And Daniel and his friends asked for time to pray. And they prayed, and as they prayed, God revealed to Daniel and his companions what Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream. Now, Daniel goes before Nebuchadnezzar to show the king what he has seen in this dream, to tell him what he's seen and explain the meaning of the dream to him. And so now Daniel begins telling King Nebuchadnezzar exactly what he had seen in this dream. Listen as Daniel describes it. You, O king, were watching and beholding a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you. Its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest, arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet part of iron, and part of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold was crushed together and became like chaff from the summer's threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So what Nebuchadnezzar saw as he saw a great image, this image had a head of gold, arms and chest of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet, part of iron, and part of clay. Now listen as Daniel continues. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation before the king. He said, King, this is what you saw. Now we're going to tell you exactly what it means. And with absolute unerring accuracy, Daniel now begins to describe what was to take place in the future for mankind. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given you kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Now watch very carefully. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the heaven, he hath given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, this kingdom that you rule over, this kingdom is this 
head of gold. Absolutely no mistaking. As Daniel pinpoints it with absolute accuracy, he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold, the kingdom of Babylon. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar had lavished all the wealth that he could gain from other empires he had lavished upon the kingdom of Babylon. It was looked upon as the golden kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar wanted that kingdom to go on and on and never end. This was his desire. In fact, as they have done excavating in the ruins of Babylon, they have found bricks with these words inscribed on them. The city which is the delight of my eyes, which I have glorified, may it last forever. Oh, he didn't want it ever to end, to go on and on and never come to an end. But God knew something else, and God has something else to say about it. In the book of Isaiah, God predicts what's going to happen to Babylon. Listen. And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans, pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Now listen carefully. It will never be inhabited. Now, dear friend, you better know something that nobody else knows. You better have insight into certain things that nobody else has insight into before you make a statement like that. I mean, before you stand up and say, it's never going to be inhabited. You better know something that nobody else knows. And that's exactly what he said about Babylon. He said, it will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherd make their sheepfold there. But wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their house will be full of owls, and ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. And tonight, if you would go with me over to the modern Republic of Iraq, out to the ancient city of Baghdad, 50 miles from Baghdad, we would come to the ruins of Babylon. It's there just like God said. The Arabian doesn't pitch his tent there. No one lives there. It lies in absolute ruins just like God said. I don't know. There may be some of you that are saying, oh, that book's a, a good book. Uh, oh, that book's a good book of history. It's a good book of literature. I want to tell you it's more than that. That book is divine. Anytime God can predict the history of the world with that absolute accuracy, you better believe that this book can give you guidance for your life. Now, there may be some of you that are a little bit like I am. Maybe you're a little hard-headed. You know, you've you got to be hit a couple times before you really accept it. Uh, you know, it just doesn't come first time. Well, if you're that way, then I want to share a text with you because God's going to tell, call the man by name. A hundred years before the man was ever born, God's going to call him by name and tell exactly how he would overthrow the city of Babylon. Look what it says in Isaiah, the 45th chapter. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. He's calling Cyrus by name and higher critics can only get within a hundred years of his birth. A hundred years before he's ever born, God has called this man by name. He's now going to say how he's going to overthrow the city, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors. Listen, the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. Cyrus was the general of the Medes and Persians. The Medes and Persians had come together and formed one power as a coalition, and they marched on Babylon. When they marched on Babylon, history tells us that the people closed all the gates to the city of Babylon. They, crew up, they crawled up on top of the wall, and they threw food to Cyrus and his men and laughed at them. Cyrus took his men, and they marched down the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River flew, flows right through the center of Babylon. 
at a selected spot, he had them begin to dig canals. And then he sent out spies, and he found that on a certain night that the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, was going to have a large party, a large celebration, and he decided they would try to take the city that night. That night he had his men break the dikes of those canals and divert the Euphrates River into those canals. And he and his men went marching up the muddy bottom of the Euphrates River. They marched inside the city, but on each side of the river were walls. But in those walls were gates, what was known as two-leaved gates, two-door gates. The guards were drunk and the gates were open, and he and his men marched into the city and overthrew it just exactly as God said it would be. Over in the palace, Belshazzar and his lords are having their celebration when all of a sudden a bloodless hand begins to write on the wall. They can't read it. It scares them so bad that it says that the king's knees smote one another. That's what it says. And finally, they called in Daniel now, almost 90 years old, and he interpreted it. This is what it said. This is the interpretation of each word. Many God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tickle, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perish, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And so the kingdom of Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians. And that's why it says that the next kingdom would be of silver, just as silver is inferior to gold. And it had two arms representing the fact that two nations came together to form one power, the Medes and the Persians. But let's continue on. And it says, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. That was Medo-Persia. Then it says, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall bear rule over all the earth. It says there would come a third kingdom of bronze. And history and scripture tells us that the next kingdom that came on the scene of action was the kingdom of Greece. Under the leadership of Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great met Darius of the Medes and Persians on the plains of Arbela. Darius had one million men. Alexander the Great had 20,000. And yet, Alexander the Great overthrew him. One historian said this about him. I am persuaded there was no nation, city, nor people then in being whether his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and his actions. Taking his army, they now march for seven years without ever going home, clear to the borders of the country of India before his men refused to go any farther and come back home. And so the third kingdom was the kingdom of Greece, bronze kingdom. Now, Scripture continues... And it says, and a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Now, God's talked about one kingdom right after another, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. Now, he says there's going to be a fourth kingdom. It's going to be as strong as iron. Inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and scatters all things, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. The fourth kingdom represented the kingdom of Rome. Rome overthrew Greece in 168 B.C. Rome was the one that was ruling at the time Jesus was born. You remember, it was the decree of Caesar Augustus that sent Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem to pay their taxes. Rome was the one that was ruling at the time Jesus died. He was tried in a Roman court. It's a Roman soldier that stuck the spear in his side. Rome ruled from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D., longer than any other power. Now listen. The image of gold, this is a statement by a historian by the name of Edward Gibbon, and he said, 
the image of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Now, if you and I had been writing a history and we said there would be one kingdom and then another and another, when we got to this point, we probably said there'd be another one. But you see, God knows what he's talking about. God, with absolute accuracy, described what was happening in this world. And listen to what he says. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay. He said, you're down to the feet and toes, and he said, as you see iron and clay, so he said the kingdom would not be together, it would be mixed. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And dear friends, that's exactly what took place. One of the great phenomena of history takes place when great masses of people all begin to move at one time. They were called the Germanic people, barbarians. They begin to move down on the Roman Empire. They were such people as the Alamani the Franks, the Hurlii, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, and they moved down on the Roman Empire and broke it to pieces. Those ten Germanic tribes settled in western Rome. Those ten Germanic tribes became the nations of western Europe today. For instance, the Alamani became the Germans. The Franks became the French. The Burgundians became Switzerland. The Suvi, Portugal. The Vandals were destroyed. The Lombards became Italy. The Hurlii and the Ostrogoths were destroyed. The Visigoths became Spain. The Anglo-Saxons became the English. You noticed that the Hurlii, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths were destroyed. When I preach on the Antichrist, I'll tell you why they were destroyed when they were destroyed and why they were destroyed because it marked a definite period of time and we'll need to look at that. But it says that the kingdom would be divided and they were divided just exactly as the scripture says it would be. Now listen as God continues. And he says the kingdom would be divided but there would be a tremendous effort made to unite the kingdom together again. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they shall not, what? They shall not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. He said there would be a tremendous effort to unite the kingdom back together, but he said it won't happen. They will not adhere. They're not going to unite. It's not too many years after the Roman Empire has fell, fallen apart until we come to a man by the name of Charlemagne. Charlemagne decides that he wants to bring the Roman Empire back together. And so he founds what he calls the Holy Roman Empire, 800 A.D. In an effort to bring everybody back together and unite all of Europe. But one historian, Voltaire, said, Concerning Charlemagne, he said that his empire wasn't Roman. He said it wasn't holy, and it really wasn't an empire. He tried, but he, di he died a defeated man, never able to bring it off. We come on down in history, and we come to a man by the name of Charles V. Charles V decides that he is going to unite all of Europe back together. Launches Europe into a bloodbath. War like they had never known before. Fighting, trying to bring it back together, but they can't. He dies, a defeated man. And then we come to a man by the name of Louis the Fourteenth of France. I'm sure you've read in history about Louis the Fourteenth. His famous Sunrise Kingdom, 
in which he was going to unite all of Europe back together, have it there. That was his wish, his desire. As you can see from the picture, Louis was a very fancy dresser. He really liked to dress. I don't know what it's been. It's been, what, uh, 10, 15 years ago now when people were wearing these shoes that had real thick soles on them and great big tall heels. Do you remember that? Huh? When they were wearing those? Uh, they thought that that was new. They thought that that was the latest fashion. Louis wore them. They've been around a long, long time. It wasn't something new at all. But he wanted his famous sunrise kingdom, but he was never able to accomplish it. And now we come to probably one of the greatest military geniuses that the world has ever known, that of Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon, he wants to unite Europe. He wants to bring all of Europe under one power. That is Napoleon's one desire more than anything else. Listen to what he had to say. I want to found a European system, a European code of law, a European court of appeals. There would have been but one people throughout Europe. Europe would soon have become one nation. That's what Napoleon wanted. And that's what he set out to do. I mean going from one nation after another, taking them, trying to bring all of Europe back together. This is what he wanted. Napoleon takes his army and they head for Russia. Do you know what defeated Napoleon? Huh? Do you know what defeated Napoleon? Oh, the Duke of Wellington at Waterloo? Huh? That's what the history books say, that the Duke of Wellington at Waterloo defeated Napoleon. I want to read to you what one historian says defeated Napoleon. The deliverance of Europe from the dominion of Napoleon was offered neither by Russia nor by Germany nor by England, what? But by the hand of... God. You know what defeated him? Something very, very small. It's called a snowflake. Taking his army, they marched into Russia. In a matter of months, they're into Moscow, and they have Moscow in flames. Napoleon now, takes his army, and they're headed out of Russia. The worst winter that Russia had ever known set in. It began to snow, snow, and snow, and the old thermometer began to drop lower and lower and lower. Until now, every day, Napoleon is losing hundreds and hundreds of soldiers from the cold and from starvation, till by the time they get out of Russia, Napoleon has lost over half of his army. In fact, it so absolutely destroyed his army that three years later, when he faces the Duke of Wellington at Waterloo, he can't overcome him because of what that did to him. Just exactly. As God said, he said, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to try to unite it all back together, but he said they won't adhere. Now, I hope you listen to that text very carefully that I read a while ago where it says they would mingle themselves with the seed of men. You see, that's an old English term. It actually means intermarry. It says that they would intermarry hoping to bring the kingdom back together. After we leave Napoleon, we now come to the time of the First World War. Over in Germany is the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm. He also has ideas of uniting Europe. Everything is right. Never in the history of mankind before has everything been so ideal 
to unite Europe. You know why? Because at this point in time, every, I didn't say almost, I said every king and queen of Europe is related. The king of England, the emperor of Germany, which is the Kaiser, the queen of Russia, the Tsarina, uh, excuse me, the queen of Greece, the Tsarina of Russia, the queen of Spain, the queen of Norway, these are all grandchildren of Queen Victoria. In fact, every king and queen are related. They're either cousins or nephews or something. Everyone is related, and so they feel that the time is absolutely right to unite all of Europe back together, and the First World War broke out. And one historian said that the First World War wasn't anything but a great big family argument, and that's pretty true. As people are dancing in the streets, in Europe, at the end of the First World War, over in Germany, in the mind of a young paper hanger, is dancing visions of a thousand-year Reich. His name is Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler believes that he is not going just to unite Europe, but he is going to unite the world, that he's going to establish a super race of people that will rule at least a thousand years. Now, let me tell you something. Don't let somebody kid you. Don't let somebody make you think that this man didn't know what he was doing. You need to go back and read some history. You need to read about some people like Spears, his architect, and some of those. Those men had visions of what they were going to do. And I can tell you, if it wasn't the hand of God, they would have done it. They would have accomplished it. God said they shall not adhere. And dear friends, they won't because God said they wouldn't. Adolf Hitler has working for him a young girl, a maid. She understands what this book says. And one day, the opportunity presented itself for her to sit down and read to Adolf Hitler this second chapter of Daniel. And she read him that second chapter and explained to him what it meant. And it made Adolf Hitler so mad that he jumped out of his chair and he stomped his foot and he said, No, no, no! It doesn't fit into my plans. And he went out and he issued this proclamation to the people of Germany. To my people, we do not need anything from God. We do not ask him for anything except that he may let us alone. We want to fight our own wars with our own guns without God. We want to gain our victory without the help of God. And they set out to do just that. And he marched across Europe taking one nation after another until finally they have arrived on the other side of the English Channel ready for the invasion of England. Far as military might, as far as know-how, as far as manpower, as far as equipment is concerned, it looks like he's going to roll right on over England. It's at this time that Winston Churchill walked down to the shores on the other side and he spoke those words that have gone down in history when he said to the people of England, I offer nothing but blood, sweat, and tears. And he told them to go from house to house and to fight. Now let me tell you something. When men go to war, don't think that they don't take into consideration every detail. I mean, they look at everything. One of the things that they look at very carefully is weather. The invasion is all planned. It's set for that morning. That night, across the English Channel and across London, moves a fog so thick that you can't see your hand in front of your face. Never before at that time of the year, oh, it doesn't stay there one day, two days. It lies there for three days. 
enough time to have the Allied forces bring in reinforcement and to withstand the invasion of Adolf Hitler. Why? Because God said, they're not going to unite. Said it, they want it here. It won't happen, dear friends. God said that's the way it would be, and you can bank on it. That's exactly what it's saying. Now listen. You don't have to worry about Russia. Russia is never going to rule this world. You don't have to worry about it. That won't ever happen. You don't have to worry about China. China, with her teeming millions of people, will never rule this world. It'll never happen, dear friend, because God said it wouldn't happen. But this is what he do does say. And in the days of these kings, the days of what kings? Oh, the days of Germany, France, England, Italy. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. In the days in which you and I are living, the time in which we're in today, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. That kingdom is never going to be destroyed. All right. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall what? Stand forever. Write it down. Put it clear, dear friend, in the days in which you and I are living in. In these days, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom, and that kingdom isn't going to last a hundred years. It's not going to last a thousand years. It's never going to be destroyed. Now, you want something to bank on? You want something to make sure? Listen. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands, that stone represents the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Talking about a stone that is cut out without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass after this. The dream is what? Now, let me tell you something. Just as certain as there was a Babylon, just as certain as there was a Medo-Persia, just as certain as there was a Rome, just as certain as the kingdom was divided, absolutely that certain, Jesus Christ is coming back. I mean, he's coming back. He says, the dream is certain. The interpretation is sure. You can bank on the book. You don't have to have any doubts. It'll happen. It'll take place just like God said it would. In the days of these kings, in the days in which you're living in and I, in our day, in the day that these world leaders are faced with problems, in the days of these kings, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. That you can rest on. Dear friend, I don't know about you, but I can tell you in waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ, that book tells me that it's near. It's not far off. Jesus is coming back. And you and I, simply by reaching out in faith, we can take hold of the promise of God and we can believe and we can be ready for the coming of the Lord. That's a promise that he gives to each one of us. Prophecy, God's Word, is something that you and I can just simply place our faith in. And I don't have to worry. If God said it, I what? believe it. He said it, I believe it, because with absolute accuracy, all those prophecies have been fulfilled. You and I are in the days of these kings. We're living in the day that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee so much for the wonderful promises of thy word. 
to know that in the days, the latter days, the days in which we're living, Jesus Christ is coming back. And we pray, Lord, that you'll bless each one, that they may reach out in faith, take hold of thy hand, walk with thee all the way into the kingdom of heaven. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen.